click go live, it says I'm live. Hi everyone, super excited to see you all. I had to tell you, I missed you this weekend. I was thinking about the class, mostly because I was like working on it all weekend, <laughs> all weekend. So I'm excited about this story. So um, I think that, oh, and I'm Mrs. Van, your friendly neighborhood English teacher. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, so I'm curious if you like this easier story or do you think you prefer the more challenging ones all last week we read really challenging stories in fact for some of you they were five or six grade levels above what you are and this story is a completely different kind of story where um just really uh a lot easier a lot more simple of a story so i'm curious about whether you liked that or didn't. I'll watch that to come in. So like it. Okay. And I, you know, I'll let you vote on how, how you feel about it. So, all right. So let's vote scale of one to five. Remember a five is, I love it so much. It, it doesn't have to be that this is my favorite of all, right? You can have multiple fives, but I love it so much. I definitely want to read it again. I might share it with somebody. I'm so glad Mrs. Van introduced it to me. And a five, and I'm sorry, that's a five. And a one is, I hate this story so much. If she ever makes us read a story like this again, I'm never talking to her again, right? Like that's a one. So, and then a three is like, eh, it's okay. Like, it's okay. It's okay. So I'm looking at this. Mm, lots of high scores for this. Autumn, no offense taken. You don't have to like the stories. Actually, sometimes we learn the most from the stories we like the least. Um, so a lot of different uh, different numbers come in. A 2.79. <laughs> okay, that's nice. Um, all right, well, I'm going to see this going on. I see, I've heard, I've seen a couple people make a thing that they're hearing an echo on the audio. Are you hearing that, Steve? I'm not hearing an echo. There was someone that said there was white noise in the background, but okay. nothing seems different to me. Okay. Checked on that. We're not hearing on our end, so not sure. All right. So as you know, we start every day with some shout outs. Now, just like I can't name all the stars in the sky, I cannot name all of the comments that came through that were worth repeating and all of the people who fill this chat with goodness and great stuff. So um, understand that just because you don't see your comment doesn't mean I didn't see it because I do go through and look at them. And um, I just want to highlight a few things that caught my eye. So in, in this one is a little bit different though because the Sweet 16 examples from the writing are going to come later. I'm going to pull those examples in later because I'm using them in the writing. So I'm not going to show those examples now. So the first thing is I got this um, yes, yes, yes from Deborah Morgan that I shamelessly invited myself to go to her class when this is over. And so I'll be glad about that. And Mr. Van wants to come too. So you'll have to let me know when I told him that you said it was okay then he was like well i want to come um and then shahir khan uh, first of all shahir uh that is a super cool name and if you feel this way it's because you're showing up and you're putting in the effort so thank you for this truly delicious compliment riley um i this is very sad this comment is really sad and i hope that one day every child in the world has access to great teaching. And in fact, I've devoted my whole career to trying to make that happen. So this comment was sad. Yeah. Um, okay. So on this insight, I thought was really interesting here. This person is talking about how in Desiree's baby, it said that Armand liked her like an avalanche or like a prairie fire. And I think this analysis is spot on, that that's not really love, like something that consumes or destroys you is not really love. And I love this idea that it could be too much or it could end too abruptly. And uh, there's there's a lot that could be looked at in that sense. So nice analysis. Um, and I think this would be really cool. And I wish I could, like that would be awesome. So nice idea. Um, and then Emma had this idea of a Q&A, and I wasn't sure whether you meant a Q&A of 
like just about like writing stuff in general. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you want, but I am open to the idea. Um, I don't mind answering questions. And then I loved both of these comments were so nice. Thank you so much. Um, I did the impossible. So I like cue mission impossible theme. So thank you for those compliments. And Nathan, you are so, 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 so welcome. All right. And then Aaron Kelly makes another appearance back to back with this insight. So this is when I asked, like, does Desiree have flaws, right? When we were talking about Desiree's baby last Friday, like, does Desiree have faults too? Or is it just Armand? And I think this is interesting. She didn't try to stand up for herself. She didn't try to survive for a child's sake. And I think he could have even gone on more and said, like, she actually ends the child's life. So I think that um, thank you for for calling that out because it's very easy in that story to see and focus on the flaws of Armand and to give Desiree a pass. And I think Erin points out she doesn't necessarily deserve a full pass. Okay, so ready to dive in to Muffin. Thank you guys so much for your comments and your participation. Okay, so um, let's visit the plot. Just in case you haven't read the story, you can be up to speed. And as always, see if you agree with me about what the steps of the story are. So first, backstory. Girls in school in England during World War II, and there's one mean girl bully. That's the backstory or the exposition. And then I think the inciting incident is when Daisy is chosen as the victim, right? Like the story wouldn't have been nearly as interesting if we had just been hearing Daisy talk about how there's this bully at school who picks on people. And I think that I can kind of prove that because later on in the story, when Daisy isn't being picked on for a short period of time, it is kind of a slower moment. So I don't think the story would have been as interesting if if Daisy hadn't been chosen as a victim. I think that's what sets this story in um, motion. So then the rising action, then um, the character Fat Alice is cruel. Um, Daisy meets the old woman, a bomb explodes. And I, I think that the climax of the story, the moment of greatest emotional intensity is when Muffin rescues Daisy, when Daisy's being attacked by Fat Alice and Muffin comes to the rescue, biting and snarling. We're going to focus more on that later on. But to me, that is, um, to me, that's the climax. And then the falling action, Daisy takes Muffin home. And then in the um, resolution, Muffin becomes the family mascot. So I think that that's the, um, I think that that's the plot outline. Curious, what do you guys think is the, um, is the plot this is one of the only stories, as you guys are telling me if you have any differences of opinion about the plot outline, this is the only story of the nine that I picked that I have not taught before. And so I was reading it for the first time when I was getting ready for this. And, you know, I read it a few times, but I think that it will maybe be interesting for you. I hope it's interesting for you to hear how I saw it in the first um, first reading. So, okay. Um, so Nerdy Fangirl says, I think the climax is when she sees the house being bombed. And I, I think that the moment that Daisy realizes that that's the house that's gone, like is, is a moment of great emotional intensity. I completely agree. Um, but I do feel like that is still part of the rising action that's building the tension. And the reason I feel that way is because it is that it, all of that relationship with Muffin is building up to this moment that Muffins rescues her. And a lot of the rising action with regard to the dog would be totally useless without that climactic moment. Um, nice. Okay, so I'm going to be going back and reading all of these. I see some of you think it's the destruction of the house, and that is a perfectly defensible position. Remember, there's no one right answer. So I think that there is um, a difference in this story that we see definitely. This story was a story that is written for young people, written for younger readers than, um, like, obviously Desiree's Baby or The Necklace. And there are stories that are written for the general public, like even for an adult reader, that we invite younger readers to read and analyze in order to develop um, analysis skills. And then there are stories that are written on purpose for a student audience so that we can teach kids analysis skills 
in writing that's geared to them. For they're not there's not a better or a worse. It's that they have a different intended audience. And so when we see that, we have to adjust our expectation. It's important, it's important, sorry. It's important to compare the story to itself. It's important not to say, well, I'm going to compare this to some amazing, great, famous work of literature. We have to accept the story and the gift that it is to us and accept that gift and not say, oh, but it's not as good as this other one, right? Not as sophisticated, not as um, charming, perhaps, in its, in its writing, not as crafted. That's okay. It is what it is. Now, one thing I will say is, you are going to do one of two things. You're going to either have to put more effort into understanding the writing. So like Desiree's Baby, The Necklace, The Cask of Amontillado, these stories that we've read, you have to put in a lot of work to understand them, right? Many of you wrote about how you have to read them more than once, right? And um, I think that in this story, you can read it one time and you have a grasp of the plot. It's not confusing. But then you might have to put more effort into getting some meaning out of it, right? So you're, as a reader, you will always be putting in effort. And the effort will either be in the deconstruction of the text itself or in trying to find a meaning in it. So the expectation that you could read a story and it would be super easy to read and it would have all of these amazing takeaways and deep richness without any effort on your part is not reasonable. Okay, next. Um, a, a next big idea is that the setting can provide more than just the time and the place. The setting can be a metaphor for the central conflict in the book. And we see that here. In some stories, the setting is less important than others. But in this story, the setting serves as a metaphor for the entire central conflict. So that is an important point to recognize as we go through this story. Okay, so jumping into the story. Um, Heidi Davis, I just caught in the comment, says that it distantly reminds her of, of Because of Winn-Dixie. And I'm with you there. Like, I, I understand it's subtle, but I do see what you're saying. And I, insight, interesting insight. Okay, so this is a line from this story, Muffin. When a war has been going on for more than a third of your life, you feel it's always been there. And what was interesting was, I was, on Friday night, I was reading the story and looking over this part, and I read this line, and then I was reading Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, and there was this line. Harry didn't know what was worse, the things that Neville was saying, or the matter-of-fact tone in which he said them. And it was a scene in which Neville was describing what it was like living at Hogwarts when all the bad guys were in charge, and everybody was in real trouble, like really struggling and suffering. And I just thought there was just this interesting connection between these two. And it was a coincidence that I happened to read two stories that had the same idea. This idea that you can get used to even things that don't seem possible to get used to. So my first question here is, how long do you think this current situation that we're living in, right? So we're talking about this story in the middle of a global pandemic that is unique and that many of us are dealing with things that we've never had to deal with before. Like probably nobody in the country has ever worried about toilet paper as much as we are worried about toilet paper right now. And that we're spending a lot more time in our families, a lot more time with each other, hesitating to do stuff, to go places, to buy, like all of these conditions. So I'm curious, how long do you think the situation that we're in right now would have to last before it would feel normal to us? Like, how long would it have to go on? <laughs> All right. So next line from the story. They didn't recognize that they were living through World War II. It was just the war. It was just a part of life. And when I first read this sentence, I thought, okay, author, just go ahead and hit me over the head with the setting. Like, it was like, she's going to tell us it's World War II and she's going to try to make it subtle, but I don't think she pulls it off. And I'm going to compare that. I'm going to ask you to hold this line in your mind because tomorrow's story to build a fire, the author's setting is crucial to the story. It's in essence a character in the story. 
and the author is more crafty, not in the sense of wily, but in the sense of full of craft um, in the way that the setting is shown. So that's an example kind of of how the writing can be easier, but then you struggle for the meaning. All right. So I'm kind of curious. Is there anything in your life appropriate for chat? Don't be stupid. Um, but is there anything in your life that you consider normal that other people might think of as odd? Like, do you eat breakfast for dinner all the time? Although, spoiler, I love breakfast for dinner. But or maybe do you go to bed really, really early or do you get up really, really early or does your family like never um, do something that other people do? Like we just never eat at McDonald's or we just never do this or that, right? Like is there something that's normal in your life like that you go to a school that is there for 10 hours a day or only two hours a day, right? So what is, um, what is that? So I see... K. Kilroy 25 says, we've been on lockdown in France for a week and it already feels normal. Yeah, that's so interesting because uh, the other night my husband and I were talking about how I was reading a book and in the book, the characters went to a party. And when I was reading, I thought, oh, you're not supposed to go to a party. You're not allowed to have a party. And I said, I am already in this groove of it, right? You know, okay, someone who doesn't like bacon. Yeah, other people might think that's odd, right? Um, you get up really early. Yeah. Not drinking soda. Yeah. Interesting. This is so interesting. Um, do gymnastics 19 hours a week. Yeah. Like that's right. A little allergic to your pet. Oh, that's so sad. Look, I've seen a couple of people who don't drink soda. So that's kind of interesting. Being the youngest kid in your class. Yeah. You go to school that starts at 843. <laughs> Like, that's so weird. Like, that's so random. Why 843? That's so random, right? You're used to below zero temperatures for months on end. Wow. Um, okay, so this is so interesting. Like, we all have things. And so one of the things that's interesting is that what Elizabeth Hires is saying is sometimes you don't even know it's considered abnormal by others, right? And you just mention it. So I think that that's one of the key takeaways from this story, I think. And I think that I picked this story without really knowing that it was going to have this message, but I think there's such a powerful message for us right now, which is there's no real point in stressing out about the situation because humans are resilient and we can get used to very difficult things very, very quickly and that we, we can handle this. We can totally handle this, that they were handling a much more difficult situation than we are and they were handling it just fine. And I'm not trying to say that if you're struggling that you're not allowed to struggle, your struggle is your struggle. But at the same time, I think it's powerful to recognize that we, we can adjust and we will adjust and we'll be fine. We'll be fine. So we have to talk about the setting. We have to talk about the setting because it is the elephant in the room in this story. Now, the setting in a story, so I'm going to do a little insert lesson on story, on story setting. So the setting is the world in which the story exists. And sometimes it will hit you over the head, just like in this one, it's World War II. And sometimes it's obvious because it'll say like star date, whatever. And then we know, oh, okay. Um, it is the time, it is the place, it is the culture, and it is the environment in which the story is happening. So you can have stories that are set at the exact same time, but they can be set in a very different culture, and then they will be a very different story. So the setting has huge impact. I want you to consider, here's an example. Have any of you ever watched Survivor? Well, so if you watch Survivor, I'd like you consider, like, look at where they put it right? Uh, would the story be as interesting if it were set in some small town in the middle of nowhere that had a Walmart and nothing else, right? Like all the characters have to do is figure out how to find good bargains at Walmart. Like that wouldn't be very exciting. I mean, would you be interested in Survivor Walmart edition? Actually, as I'm saying that, I realize it might actually be funny. Like anyway, but if, think about think about this. Let's say I have three kids and um, imagine that I lost one of my kids how different would it be if I lost one of my kids in the halls of my school versus losing one of my kids in like a huge amusement park like Disneyland or Six Flags, right? How would it be different? The setting is crucial. The setting is crucial. You have to appreciate the setting and you have to evaluate for yourself what is the writer trying to do with this setting? And the answer may be nothing, right? The answer may be the setting is just there and it doesn't have that much impact on the story. But often the author has chosen the setting with deliberation and you have to honor that.
in order to be a good reader, right? Okay, so in setting, some authors zoom in on the setting. They give you tons of details. It really is like being hit over the head with a hammer. Like, okay, we get it. It's in Alaska, right? I just read a story that was set in Alaska, a big book that was set in Alaska. And by the end of it, I felt like, well, never need to go to Alaska, right? Although it, it did kind of make me want to go. But some authors will zoom way in and some authors will keep it blurry. It's like just any town America or any town France or any town Australia or whatever, right? Um, now, I'm finished with setting and I'm going to mention this. When I was a kid, there was a cartoon called Fat Albert and then it became Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids. And there they would say, hey, 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 it's Fat Albert. And it was so weird to see this main character called um, Fat Alice because it was so similar to Fat Albert. And a part of me was like, hey, you stole that. And this is how we see her introduced. Fat Alice was a part of life too, unfortunately. So we already know she's bad. A single word tells us she's bad news, right? She was the boss of the school playground, a big pasty-faced girl with short, straight hair and an incongruously shrill voice. Now, it's interesting to me that we tend to connect bad people to physical traits that are not popular or not trendy or not considered to be in style or desirable. Here, the bully is fat and unattractive. And I'm curious what you think about that. I'm curious about whether you think that's fair or right. In Harry Potter, we see that with Snape, who has greasy hair and they're always teasing him, or people who are teased, like characters who dress badly or who smell badly. We often see internal characteristics being mirrored by an external characteristic. The evil person is often either ugly or coldly beautiful. Those are two common tropes that we see. So sometimes the author will make the evil character unattractive to give a motive for the meanness, right? Like they're unattractive and, and because of that, they feel a lot of self-doubt and self-loathing and they transfer that onto others. And so I'm curious about whether you think Fat Alice is a bully because she's called Fat Alice or do they call her Fat Alice because she's a bully and they don't like her? kind of interested in this. So yeah, this is this is the question. Why, when, which do you think is the author's purpose in making Alice unattractive? I like to see your comments go by and see what you say. Sometimes that's the reason they're evil. Yep, absolutely. So it's interesting, Dopey Doorknob says, it's cruel and stereotypical, but it sets more of the mood of their personality. So that's kind of interesting, right? Like while like holding two competing ideas in your mind, uh, strong, strong impact there. Nice analysis. Okay, so then we have this. A group of hangers-on drifted in her wake. Notably, Pat and Maggie, two wispy, wiry girls who hovered about her like pilot fish escorting a shark. As prey for her little gang, Fat Alice chose a particular victim at the beginning of each term, and this term she had chosen Daisy. And I'll admit, the first time I read this line, I was like, eh, this is a pretty cliched. Fat, mean girl, followed by skinny, hanger-on, mean girls. But I liked the shark metaphor. That caught me right away, because I think there's a lot of connection that you can make between sharks and bullies, in that they're both misunderstood, they both can be dangerous, um, they're they're disliked sometimes fairly sometimes unfairly and she also introduces the main character daisy in this pretty compelling way right this term it's daisy and just the the shortness the abruptness of that line is nice you d and i think that one thing that's important is you don't have to like everything about a story to like a story and to get something out of it so here is um uh this where she gets, um, uh, she's being bullied by Fat Alice and she reacts this way. She aims a furious kick at her and then she's seen by like the lunch monitor person. And 
one of the things I think you'll notice in this story is occasionally, not always, but occasionally an overuse of adjectives. I think it's going over the top to say bulging leg, furious kick. I think it's a little, little strong. Um, but I think that that's what we often get in less sophisticated writing. And so, and this writing is intended for less sophisticated readers. And so it's fair. It's not that it's a mistake. It's a deliberate choice on the author's part. But when you are writing, it is important to consider how much subtlety can my reader handle? Do I really need to give them this much? Because this is not subtle. Even the poor grammar of Mrs. Walker is designed to show you that she's a bad person, right? I seen that, right? Like grammar is a status marker. And when people use poor grammar, it's one of the ways that we can be dismissive of them. So, um, and I think, I, I think that what's really important here is this, is what's really going on is this where the the bully gets away with it and the person who's responding gets caught. I mean, how common is that? I think we've all seen that, right? I mean, don't don't you hate it when that happens? <laughs> Haven't you seen that in your real life where the person who was really the instigator doesn't get caught, but then the other person does? And this is interesting too. This was Alice's favorite torture. She learned it from her brother. And it made me think, like, is bullying hereditary? Like, or is it what's going on in that house that's made both of the kids um, bullies, right? What's what's going on? And then we get this. We meet Muffin, the title character, for the first time, but we don't know his name yet. A dog was barking fiercely on the other side of the fence. The little gray terrier with sharp pricked ears and tail, and beside him stood the old lady who lived in the house next to the school. So this is how we meet two really important characters. And what happens then is that the old woman kind of rescues Daisy just a little bit. She's done just this one nice thing for Daisy. And I was curious how common you think it is for people to form a relationship just based on one small thing. And it makes me wonder what small things we might do for each other that would lead to a relationship. It would be an interesting social experiment. Like if you decide to see, like I'm gonna do a bunch of nice things for people and I'm just gonna see where it leads because in this story it leads somewhere pretty powerful. I've seen a few of you mentioning that maybe she was bullied by her brother and that that's where she learned it. That's an interesting idea because we do know he's older than her. Um, so that's kind of an interesting idea. So curious what you think about the power of small things to make a difference in a relationship. And then she asked, Daisy asks if she can give the dog a little piece of gristly meat that she saved for her lunch. And here, I think we see a more subtle introduction of a piece. Remember, she kind of hit us over the head with World War II, but now she says, Muffin, show your manners. So she calls the dog, and that's a very natural thing to do, right? Daisy wants to give the dog meat. I need to get the dog's attention. So she calls the dog by name. That's how we learn the dog's name. She says the dog's name without saying, here is the dog. His name is Muffin. Enter Muffin, right? It's a little more subtle. So names matter. So let's think about this. When you name a dog, you usually name it before you know its personality, right? People don't wait six months to name their dog. And I wonder if this dog strikes you as a muffin, right? Like, does this dog strike you as a dog that should be named Muffin? Like, what do we think of and associate with muffins? And is that the same, right? Now, names are important. Names matter. And we're going to see that when Daisy calls Alice a name, even though Fat Alice is already a pejorative. And a pejorative is a negative name that you would call somebody. She says, Alice Smith is a Nazi. Alice Smith is a Nazi. So when Daisy is telling her mother about the incident, this is the term that she uses. She says Nazi. And we tend to group our enemies with the worst kind of people, right? If you had lived during the 1950s and early 60s, the worst thing you could call somebody would be like a communist, right? Oh, you're, you're a communist. So what Daisy is saying is Alice represents everything that's wrong with the world, right? She is the ultimate bad person. And every age has its own, every society has its own 
thing like that, right? Like you, you, you can think there are words today that you would say, oh, she's so, or he's such a, and that would be like the worst thing you could say. And then this is what's ridiculous. The, the teacher, you know, Daisy tells the teacher and the teacher spoke reproachfully to Fat Alice and then it got made worse. And it's just this injustice. And this is how the author is building the tension of the story. It's just like, no matter what Daisy does, she just feels like she can't get out of this situation. And no matter what she does, nothing works. You know, she knows, like if she talks to the teacher, Fat Alice just gets her more. If her mother gets involved, it's not going to be effective. It's just this feeling that is being built of hopelessness. And the feeling of hopelessness is almost some of the it is probably almost the worst feeling you could have because a complete feeling of hopelessness is despair. And that is one of the most difficult things as a person to endure is a feeling of despair. And it says that Daisy felt desperate, that there was no escape, that her whole life, right? She just feels like sometimes we're going through something so hard that we just can't even see beyond that moment. Like, how could this ever be better? And even if logically we can say, well, I'll be in a different grade next year or, you know, I won't always go to school with her. It's hard to see beyond that. And I think the author does a good job of helping us see that. I mean, it won't. we know that it won't really be her whole life, but the author is helping us see how it feels like that. She feels hopeless. Um, so now she sees when she goes up on impulse to the woman's house, we have this moment and it's a deceptively simple line that beside the front door, a forsythia bush was blooming like a great yellow cloud. Now, there's this nice simile, a great ye- like a great yellow cloud, and if any of you have seen forsythia bloom, you know it really does look like that. But there's a symbolic meaning, too, here, because the forsythia is like the earliest bush of all, like it's the earliest shrub that blooms in the spring, one of the first bushes to bloom in the spring. And so there's this quiet message here that rewards the reader, especially the repeat reader, that Daisy has been living in this winter of despair. And now spring is coming and that the old woman represents the spring. Better days are coming. I just love that moment. I saw a question go by that I think was interesting, which was, do you have to have a pet to understand this story? I think that's an interesting question. I don't, my gut reaction would be no, but I, because I think that you don't have to have a pet to understand the value of pets. You've seen other people with their pets and you've seen TV shows and movies with pets, but I definitely think that our personal experience helps us bring things more to the story. Um, in fact, I will tell you that later on in the story, I'm going to try to remember, tell you a personal story that I thought of when I was reading this one that goes that answers that okay so yes the forsythia is a form of foreshadowing nice 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 catch nicole awesome okay so then we get to the main event (laughs) the main event where the old woman says to her when daisy asks like will you please tell the teacher what you've seen like maybe she'll believe you even if she doesn't believe me and the old woman says yes Bullies must be stopped by any means possible. That's what this war is all about. And this is the moment when it all becomes clear because now we see why the author has set the story in World War II. She needed this overarching idea of the world's biggest bully in the form of Hitler and all his minions and how connecting that to Alice and her minions and that what's the point of fighting a war against a bully if then you're not going to do anything about daily bullies if you're going to tolerate the daily bullies in your life what's the point right it's like it's like exactly what we're experiencing right now it doesn't really matter if you're going to try to protect yourself from a virus if then you're going to leave meat out on the counter for three days and then eat it and get food poisoning like it just doesn't make any sense and there's so much that's going on here it's kind of like we get angry sometimes at either our schools or our community governments or even our federal government for something that they're doing or not doing, but then we're doing the exact same thing in our own lives 
or we're not doing the same thing in our own lives. Like, oh, well, you didn't prepare adequately for that, but then maybe we weren't prepared either. Or you didn't handle that well, but we often don't handle things well. That we have this different expectation and there's so much in this one line. I think we could literally, and maybe I'm on in danger of doing that, but I think we could literally talk about this one line the whole time. Uh, and I'm curious, is it really true that bullies must be stopped by any means possible? Like, what happens if we don't stop bullies? What happens? I'm looking for, at some of these comments that go by, and Cloudfall says, yes, some people get so caught up in the huge events that they miss the little ones. They're exactly the same. And that is so, 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 so true. All right, now, good readers push back. So I'm curious. Do you think the author chose this setting on purpose to be able to make this comparison? Do you think that she deliberately said, I want to be able to compare this to Hitler, so I'm going to set the story in World War II? And I'm curious if you can come up with, see if you can come up with another time in the past that she could have chosen that would have had the same effect. So not, like, I want something in the past that could have the same effect. So it seems like many of you believe that the author chose this setting on purpose. I'm curious if any of you can come up with another alternate setting that might have worked. I think it's a hard question. I'm curious if any of you come up with anything. Aaron Stillinger, the Civil War. Hmm. The, the thing that the Civil War would lack is a, a single evil force, right? There's no, there's no person who's like no one bully like like Hitler. There's no Hitler. Um, any war might have worked. I see. I think, I think that that maybe um, username Chris Potter is more onto it with the American Revolution, where we have King George as a clear bully, um, or even certain Revolutionary War generals on the British side. Um, oh, Genghis Khan. Nice. Yeah some interesting ones. Um, so and I'm, it's interesting to see this, right? Interesting. Okay, so then we get this, the, the, the shelter. She pulled on her raincoat over pajamas and they go into the little turf-roofed metal-walled cave sunk into the backyard and uh, into the back lawn. So I went and got a picture of it. These were called Anderson shelters and this is what they looked like. So Anderson shelters were small. They were cold. They were damp. In fact, you could grow mushrooms in them really well. And some people did to eat. It's, I think it's good for us to see one so that we can see that hanging out in one for any length of time would have been no fun. And that those of us who are complaining about hanging out in, in warm, comfy houses are, <laughs> we're really not making that big of a sacrifice, right? Um, this is one of those, right? Um, this is one of those. Ooh, nerdy fangirl, the Texas Revolution represent the Republic here. Yeah, General Santa Ana could be considered that it, uh, from the perspective of Texans, right? From the perspective of Texans. So I just wanted you to see what one of these shelters looked like. And I also went and grabbed this picture of some children. This is children in London sitting outside what was left of their home after a bomb strike. Um, and I think that it's just uh, so like all three of them with their hand, like that's a striking photo. And I think that it's important for us to truly understand the setting that this is going on in. We can't understand what it was like to live in this. And I hope that some of you went and looked at either the videos or read the article about the Blitz. And if you haven't, you can do that. It's in the folder for this story. Um, but it's important to understand that in order to fully understand the story and what she's saying. So then... The police officer tells Daisy that the woman is killed in the bomb strike and she's just stunned, right? And it's this idea like spring has turned to winter overnight. And I mean, literally, like, look, like the, the this is a colorized picture, but this is just rubble. Like what, what was beautiful blooming spring one day is just gray rubble the next. And so there's this strong juxtaposition of spring and winter and this strong juxtaposition of hope and despair 
And the author captures that in Daisy's thinking, right? Her, in addition, it's the shock of having somebody who you actually knew who dies. And it's, it's really interesting. Now, digestive biscuits are just cookies. The British call cookies biscuits. What, what, what in, an, in the United States, what we would call cookies, they would call biscuits. And my husband is Australian and he says biscuit too. And so digestive biscuits were just these cookies that were like not very sweet. They had a lot of wheat in them, but they, they weren't really very good for you. They just called them that so people could justify eating them. All right. So now here's the building of the relationship that Daisy takes some pennies, right? She doesn't have any money. Um, and she buys a bun and she throws it at the woman's house where Muffin will find it. And this is the building of the relationship. And it's so key because it's going to be important later. And one thing I want to focus on here is that Daisy gives Muffin what she knows Muffin would want, not what Daisy would want, right? Daisy wouldn't necessarily want the same things as a dog. And this is the platinum rule. The golden rule is do unto others as you would have done unto you. But the platinum rule is do unto others as they would have done to them. Like you might like, you might like a text message, but your grandma might prefer a phone call, right? And so you want to do unto others. Sorry, my necklace feels wonky to me. Um, you want to do unto others as they would have done. And I think there's an invitation to us all here right now in this, in this times that we're living in to consider what some of the people who we know like, how could we reach out in a way that would be meaningful to them, right? Okay. And I'm curious, why do you think she cares so much about the dog? Why do you think she cares so much? I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't really know this dog that well, right? And I'm curious why she cares so much about the dog. This is the dog. Thin and dirty. His ears and tail weren't perky. Some of the children tried to find him, but he always runs away. And this was one of the questions I have. Why the dog is so wary of people? Like, there's no sign that he's ever mistreated. Why this fear? And this is something where I feel like the author could have added something here. Because we need the, do we need the dog to be wary. The dog has to be wary. The dog has to hide out there or else that climactic moment where he comes racing and saves her. Sorry, spoiler. Um... It won't be meaningful if the dog's not scared of people. It's the fact that the dog has been hiding and hiding and hiding and refusing to come out and then later is going to come out. This has to be built. This tension has to be built. But I think the author didn't build it. I don't think the author succeeded. I think the author did not explain to us sufficiently to make it believable why the dog was so wary of people. I actually would say I didn't think that was done well. So Alice had been distracted but now she's back, right? And it's interesting that the bombs are so destructive, but there's a silver lining, right? Like, oh, it's bad that all this stuff got destroyed, but at least Fat Alice isn't bothering me. It's like the woman, the old woman kind of protected her, even from like the next life. It was really astonishing. Now, to help us see the picture that Daisy paints, the author uses lots and lots of color words. Lots of color words we really can see. She's describing the painting very, very, very well. And she needs us to see it so that we can see how alive to Daisy her connection with her dad was. Remember, her dad is away fighting the war. She doesn't get to see him and all she has are memories of him. All she has of him is what's in her mind. And this description tells us Daisy feels very connected to him and that it's very meaningful to her. And so what happens next makes it even more, right? The teacher calls out and highlights Daisy's painting, tells her to take it home and then bring it back so I can show it to the whole school. And on the way home, she gets nabbed by Alice and Co. and attacked here, right? And it's so interesting because... Alice is bullying her about how stuck up she is about her painting, but but Daisy doesn't even care about that. Like the painting isn't meaningful to Daisy because of that. The painting is meaningful to Daisy because of her dad. It's the emotional meaning. It's not about even how it looks. It's just the meaning that it has with it. She cares about it because it's connected to her dad. And so Alice is bullying her over something that isn't even true. And I think that's so often the case of bullying. Bullies often, often target people for things that aren't even true true. Now, when Alice throws her painting in the mud, this is when Daisy reaches her breaking point. And it reminds me of Montresor in the necklace. It's like, I've taken all of this, but I can take no more. And so this is why I think this is the climax. And we get this beautiful moment with a dog. There's a sudden astounding noise halfway between a roar and a shriek. And the, I think this is the best writing of the whole story. 
this scene, the best writing of the whole story, in my opinion. I'm interested to see if any of you have a different opinion. To me, this is the best. Um, he, oh, it's so amazing. He comes rushing. He looked very small and very dangerous. He flung himself at Fat Alice. Notice these beautiful participles. Notice these beautiful, beautiful participles. Growling, snapping, nipping, jumping. Oh, so nice. And then a small dog, more figurative language. A small dog becomes a small tornado. Notice that? It's like, it's it's a form of anaphora, right? It's this, a small dog, a small tornado. Beautiful, more participles. Um, it's just so amazing. Keep going. I am loving this. Look at this. I just pulled them out. This is all of the participles I pulled out just out of a single phrase, like this single sentence. It's so lovely. Absorb this power. Let it flow through you. The power of the present participle. Ah, gorgeous. Okay, so then Daisy takes the dog home after it rescues her and she wants to show her mom. Oh, I told you I was going to tell you a story. Okay, so this, this story. Um, I want to tell you a personal story. When I read this story, it made me think of this. So when I was, um, when my kids were really young, we had a dog named Kita. And Kita um, ended up, Kita was problematic because she was a little aggressive. And she would bite strangers. And this was a real problem. And we had to keep Kita separated from kids when they would come over and it was a real problem but one day I was getting the mail out at the street at the mailbox and I had my son who was still a baby my son Gregory he was still a baby and I had him on like on my hip you know and I was holding him with one hand and I was opening the mailbox with the other hand and all of a sudden this really vicious dog who I had seen kill another dog in the front yard across the street like this is a vicious dog this dog came running up and jumped at me and was lunging at me and my baby was screaming and I like, I'm having a hard time defending myself because I've got like the male in one hand and my baby in the other hand. And all of a sudden, Kita jumped over a six foot fence and she was not a big dog. She was a little dog, like smaller than my golden retriever I have now. She jumped over a six foot fence and she went after that dog just like this, just like this. And I, I just remember it. And when I read it, I thought, boy, she described exactly what it's like. It's like a tornado. So after this, Daisy takes Muffin home and and says, you know, dad says every ship should have a mascot. And so I thought, were ship mascots a thing? And so I went and looked it up. They were. They were a total thing. They were used for security. They were used for pest control. And they were used as companionship for the people on the ships. And they included, I found examples of ship mascots that were monkeys, parrots, cats, but especially dogs. So I went and pulled one from a British ship that would have been something like Daisy's dad was on. And it was, um, this is the HMS Scarab. It's a British ship. And this is its mascot, Rags. And, it, and Rags is actually kind of famous. You can find lots of pictures of Rags. And Rags is a terrier, just like Muffin in the story. So I think it, that is kind of insight into the fact that the author did a little bit of research. Now, the most interesting mascot I found, this is a U.S. Navy mascot. And this was a bear. This mascot was a bear. And this this uh, U.S. Navy ship had this bear as a mascot, but that's not a sustainable situation. And so the bear went to live in the San Diego Zoo. But isn't that just crazy? I saw that somebody asked me, what did the owner of that dog do? Um, they ended up getting a citation from the city for having a dangerous dog because now it had attacked a person too. Um, but most dogs, most dogs are not like that. So most dogs are truly wonderful. Most dogs who are aggressive, it's really more of the fault of the owner and not the dog. Okay, so I'm curious about if you think a family could use a mascot and how are the reasons similar? Remember, they use, they use the mascots on the ships for security, pest control, and companionship. And so how are those reasons the same or different than why a family might need a mascot? And do you want to start calling your dog like the family mascot or your cat? Or like, I know um, one of the people in the class is a friend, the, the child, a friend of mine, and I know they have like a tank of, a saltwater tank of fish, and I'm wondering if like their fish can be their mascots. They used to have a hedgehog. I think a hedgehog makes a better mascot than fish, but um, I'm just curious if yours is going to be a, a um, 
mascot now. Okay, so guess what? We have to join into, is it really what they base Winnie the Pooh off of? <laughs> I'm curious if that's really true, Madeline, now. Um, the actual Winnie. I got to go look that up now. I'm curious, right? That's what's great about reading is when it makes you want to go learn more. Like I didn't even know about this. And so it makes you want to go learn more. And that's the power and that's the beauty. Okay, so Sweet 16 are writing adjective clause. So do you remember this question? Do you remember this question? The scientist insert adjective clause? Uh, yeah, friends, there was some confusion. If you did this, you're correct. The scientist a master leader of the big experiments lives in blah, blah, blah. the scientist, the mastermind behind the scientist, the one who almost always almost exploded lab, the scientist, the mastermind behind the COVID. Oh, I did that one twice. Sorry. Um, if you did this, you were right. What I saw was this. Who is an introvert? Who finds a cure? Who would rather research and party? Who made a new toilet paper roll that lasts a year, which by the way, we really need instead of an introvert, the finder of the cure the researcher, not partier, the toilet paper roll inventor, right? I, I saw the wrong thing. And you know what that tells me? Oh, I also saw this, a bunch of prepositions and participles. Okay, and I'm giving you suggestions for how to fix that, right? Okay, so here is what's going on. In an A positive phrase, which is what we talked about last Friday, it is a noun that follows another to describe it. And so what we say is that the noun that follows the first noun, so in this case, the first noun is scientist, then the noun that comes after this, we say that it is in apposition to it. It's kind of like the opposite of opposition, right? If I'm in opposition to you, I'm disagreeing. Apposition, I'm agreeing. So an a positive phrase is agreeing, right? It's in apposition to the noun. An adjective clause is different. An adjective clause, so our sweet 16 for today is adjective clause, because some of you were throwing down adjective clauses when really it was um, an a positive, and that is my fault, right? That's my fault, because it means I didn't distinguish it clearly enough. So an adjective clause functions like an adjective, not a noun, and they're sometimes called relative clauses instead. You'll see it called both things, because it usually starts with a relative pronoun and the relative pronouns are like who, whom, which, what, that, when, wherever, right? When, where, and they're dependent. So a positive, a noun or a noun phrase or a noun clause. Adjective, not a noun, right? A positive phrases usually begin with an article. Adjective clauses usually begin with a relative pronoun. So not, so if you start the clause with who, then that's not going to be an a positive. It's going to be a, it's going to be an adjective. So what's confusing is that adjective clauses and a positives do the same thing, which is that they describe. Now they have differences as well, meaning that adjective clauses modify, like adjectives do, right? They clarify or limit the meaning, and then but and a positives rename or define. So there's that difference, but they are difficult to tease apart sometimes because of they both describe. So I want to show you examples. An a positive, a pioneer herself in developing vaccinations or a member of the team working on the Mars Land Rover. Those were ones that were actually done that I turn into a positive. An adjective clause would be who was bad at social distancing or that went on a, to Florida on a vacation. All right. So let's try again, shall we? The goldfish, insert uh, a positive, swam in its bowl listlessly. Okay, so remember, an a pot, the goldfish, insert a positive, swam in its bowl listlessly. So yes, in general, I saw a question in the comments. In general, an a positive will be, it's always going to be a noun. It's always going to be a noun. And it will almost always start with an article like a, an, or the, a, an, or the. And an adjective phrase will almost always start with a relative pronoun, who, whom, that, which, when, wherever, where. So the goldfish, insert a positive. So a, an, or the. The one that talked. Oh, that would be super cool. That would be super cool. Um, the one that looked like Nemo. Nice. So, oh, and thank you, Anna, for the... Um, for the clarification on Winnie the Pooh. That's super interesting. The one that had a large head, the one that hated finding Dory, the one who was badly hurt, the one named Nemo, a bright orange and blue fish. Very nice. Perfect. You have 
got it. Okay. Oops. Oops. That we got at the festival, that won't work. That we got at the festival would be an, an adjective clause, right? We want to start with a, an, or the. Okay. So nice, a positives. Don't say who, who was bored. No, no, no. We don't want to say who. That's adjectives. That's adjectives. There's, that's a relative pronoun, right? So I want to, I'll insert an adjective clause here. You remember who, whom, who's, which, that, when. So now try it. Now try it, an adjective clause. The goldfish, insert adjective clause, swam in its bowl listlessly. The goldfish, a beautiful specimen, nice, a positive. A goldfish, the one who looked like an epic gamer, a positive. The goldfish, the one who almost dies, a positive. The goldfish, a brave wish, a positive. The goldfish, the one who hated humans, a positive. The goldfish, the one who had plenty of water, a positive, right? The goldfish, you guys did a great job. The goldfish, the one, the goldfish, a. That's a positive. I'm looking for some adjective clauses now. I'm sure they'll come in. Remember, I got a little, little delay, so it takes a minute for you guys to catch up to me. Okay, the goldfish who only ate human flesh. Okay, creepy but accurate. Who was separated from his family? Perfect. Who ate a fly? A companion of the dog is an A positive. Remember, A and the. Who was bored? Who watched me in my sleep? Who was afraid of water? That's irony. Who ate the turtle? That belonged to me. Nice. Remember, who, if you're starting with the, a, or an, you're probably in an A positive, right? Start with a relative pronoun. Who, whom, whose, that, which, when, where, wherever. Okay, I think you've done a good job. Good job, peeps. All right, so looking at this story from our theme of justice, I think that this story is so different from the others that we've read, and yet it enfolds beautifully in our theme of justice. I think that's so interesting how you can take a theme and you really can get lots of stories to follow that same theme. And we've chosen this universal theme of justice. And I'm curious, why do you think bullies get away with it so often? Like, why is it so hard to get justice? And this other question I have for you is... When the story ends, we still don't know what happens with Alice. And I'm curious what you think happens. So when I ask these questions, sometimes I'm going to pause and I'm going to look for your answers to come through the chat. And sometimes I'm throwing it out as just a reflective question, like for you to consider. Like this question, why do bullies get away with it? I think that that is something to really consider. Why is it so hard to get justice? And is there something that can be changed? I think that's something that is worth thinking about after class. And I am very curious about seeing your answers of this. What do you think happens with Alice? What do you think happens with Alice? Um, Kellett, if I said that right, says bullies are good at hiding. And I think that's absolutely true. And we see that in this story, right? Um, oh, it says adults can't stop it. Mm, it's interesting. Like, why? It's so, like, Why? Curious about what you think happens. And sometimes maybe the thing itself doesn't happen, but your ability to manage it does. Like you feel more supported and sustained and so you can handle the bad thing. I'm not sure. It's kind of interesting. Oh, Alice would stay away from Daisy because she's afraid of her dog. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Kind of cool. I can't wait to see your answers. All right. So let's learn from some writing rock stars again. And then... Just like normal, I'm going to show some examples of things that I want to point out, and then I will give you a writing prompt for tomorrow. If you have to duck out, the writing prompt will be up um, in about probably 10 minutes from now in the folder, and I'm looking forward to it. Just like last week, I've graded everything that was in there, except there was one I couldn't because the person had limited access, and I, I couldn't get in it to comment. So be careful of the settings. Um, okay, up to grade eight. First example. I, uh, I want to point this out because of the beautiful structure, the use of the semicolon here, and that the example is solid. So the reader just can't help but agree with you, and that's exactly what you're going for. The first time we read this, we didn't know why he was acting that way. The second time, we understand that he believes she is part black and is feeling betrayed. And I love that because it shows sympathy to an unsympathetic character. So sophisticated, really strong. All right. Um, and notice, this is a strong reason. Like, why should you read it again? This is why you should read it again, because you understand the character. All right, next example. Um, this is a very simple opening line, but important, right? 
Rereading can give you lots more useful information about a story. This is a young writer, and so we don't need a lot of, I'm not expecting a lot of sophistication in the structure, but what I want you to notice is that this very young writer did something that some older writers often will not do, which is give us a strong opening statement. You have to tell the reader what you're going to prove, and this person does it. Next example, oh man, this, this was really something, such a lovely embedded quote I just had to share. The letter um, meant for him not to read, so he would not, I, there's some beginning of it. I just want you to focus on this embedded. He would not know the truth that Armand's, quote, mother, what I want to point out here is not only is the embedded quote structured correctly, but also that it, it flows in the sentence, right? It's not separated out from the sentence. Like, here, let me give you a quote. It's beautifully flowing in the, in the structure and syntax of the sentence. And when you can do that, when you can make the quote just part of the sentence, I think you're maybe going to see that again um, later as well. This is so powerful. This is what you want to do. All right. Next, the story is comparable to a tapestry. Every time you take a glance, you notice some detail you missed the first time. I just absolutely love this comparison. And I, I love the metaphor of tapestry and the author went through to make it even more clear. And I thought this was a lovely insight. I think I just saw Cookie Cookie say, I'm staying even though I didn't submit. And you know what? The people whose writing is getting way, way better are the people who are watching what I say. And the way I know that is because I can see it in the writing. And so it, it's worth staying for because your writing will improve by looking at these examples. So this sixth grader successfully creates an effective closing sentence. And I want to point this out because this is something that I would say probably 70% of the samples are lacking an effective concluding sentence. So I want you to see that the sixth grader does a nice job with this. Transition word, boom, right? Overall, you can use a transition word or phrase, but give me a transition word or phrase that shows conclusion. Remember, I put that transition word handout in the folder, use it. And then tell me what you prove specifically, not just it's always a good idea to read stories again, but tell me why, what am I going to get out of it? It should be directly connected to what you showed in your writing. All right, ninth and 10th examples. The first time we read this, we didn't know why he was acting that way. The second time we, oh, I already did that one. Um, sorry, I liked it so much, I've been in it twice. Okay, um, this is just such a strong beginning. With a beginning like this, the reader is already on your corner and that's half the battle right? The best books get better and better the more you read them. This is the case with Desiree's Baby because everybody always, like, people are ready to agree with you. And I just loved this. Now, usually I'm looking for a single opening sentence, but if you're going to be willing to write a little bit longer, you can take two sentences. And this is just so nice. So nice. All right. The be this is another example. The better you understand the writing, the more it can impact your emotions. And I think this fifth grader, this is a fifth grader, just nails a universal truth here that writing is supposed to impact your emotions and it will do that better. And I, so obviously I have a fifth grader in the wrong section. Sorry about that. But it will do better if you understand it more. And I wish all students understood this. Like I think the fact that someone only like what, 10 or 11 years old already has figured this out. And when you figure this out, that the more you understand the writing, the more it impacts your emotions and your understanding of people and their culture, then then writing, any writing, even writing that you're, you've been assigned to do becomes less an assignment and more of an opportunity and experience. So I really like that. All right, next one. The endings are similar. Why I wanted to point this out is that I love this, this opening sentence because the last phrase creates such curiosity on the part of the reader. I read this and I know these stories, right? I teach these stories and yet I was interested to see where the writer was going to go with that. When you can create interest in the part of a reader who has who has strong understanding of the text, then you have done a good job. You have been really effective. It's effective. It creates curiosity without being overly dramatic. So we know that the writer is going to try to prove this and we already care about, and this is exactly what you're going for. Notice this. They're also different because of the price that was paid. It's like, ooh, price that was paid. All right. And then this is a continuation of that same piece. I want you to see, this is a 10th grader. I want you to see the way that the arguments here are set out so beautifully parallel. Any teacher would be thrilled with this because of the command of structure. Notice this. The Loiselles may have wasted 10 years of their lives, but even so, it's only 10 years on a lifetime. In addition to that, the time was not necessarily wasted because it could be argued. I love that phrase. It could be argued. In, in literary analysis, argument doesn't mean fight. Argument means taking a stand that you support. 
It could be argued that they become better people through their hard work. Desiree and her baby, however, right? Using that transition word, however, it shows me that you're going to make a comparison. They lost their entire lives, not just 10 years. And there's no benefit. They're not made better from the experience. So that beautiful parallel structure, when you're being asked to compare and contrast, this is what you're going for. This is what you're going for. All right, 11th and 12th graders. Oops. When Armand learned this, he was downright mean to her like he was to his slaves. So this is actually an eighth grader responding to the 11th and 12th grade prompt. And I want to point out this comparison because when I read it, I thought, oh, you're right. He started treating her like she was a slave. Why? Because now she believed, now he believed that she actually really was more one of them than one of us, right? This sense of the other really powerful. And we'd already seen how he treated them. So, ouch. So, and this points out an important part. If you are a younger um, participant in the class, you are welcome to try to challenge yourself with the more advanced prompts. Feel free to do whatever prompt is interesting to you. All right. So let's write. Let's see what the prompts are today. Uh, um, okay. Let me pull myself down a little bit here. Okay. Uh, through eighth grade. In about 100 words, describe what you think Daisy could have done. This isn't right. Oh, yeah, this is right. I'm getting nervous because remember last week I messed up. <laughs> All right. Uh, what could Daisy have done differently to solve the situation with Alice? Like we see a couple things she tried, but what could she have tried differently? Okay. If you are ninth and 10th grade, discuss the ethics of calling someone fat Alice. Do you think that others have a responsibility to avoid this kind of thing in their writing or can it serve a purpose even though it's offensive? And then in 11th and 12th graders, I want you to imagine how the story would have been different had it been set in modern day America. I want to specifically see like what would have been maybe stronger, what maybe would have been less effective, more effective. Remember, all of you writing, you must take a stand and take that stand in the opening sentence and then support that stand with examples from the text and analysis and then a closing sentence, all structured that way. All right, so there we go. Um, I see Heidi saying, yay, another 100 word one. I'm keeping the younger grade ones shorter. Feel free to write more. Some of you are and it's wonderful. What what doesn't really work, if you only give me one or two sentences, then I don't really have a lot to do analysis on. So be careful about being too short if you're looking really for feedback. Um, so to lengthen your writing, structure out exactly what I'm saying. Like make your statement and make it broad enough that you can talk about it for a while, right? Your opening sentence needs to be broad enough that you can talk about it for more than one line. And then what you want to do is that you want to use examples from the text and then say what they show or what they mean. And when you do that, then you, you really could go on forever because you all have really strong insights. There have only been a couple of them that I've read where I've thought this person just doesn't get it. Almost everybody has, you, you've got strong insight into the story. You understand these stories like way better than I would ever expect, especially from some of you in lower grades. So I am looking forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. Honey, um, honey do I tea, feel free to write longer than 200 words. It's fine. And I will see you guys tomorrow. And, oh, I want to say something about tomorrow's story. Tomorrow's story. Okay, remember, put your writing in the muffin folder. And then two links for tomorrow. Tomorrow's story to build a fire. The full version is that top link. The shorter abridged version, the bottom link. This story is uh, a difficult story. Like, it's it's a hard, like, it's not, it's not as difficult as the lottery that we're going to read later in the sense of disturbing. But it's, it's, it's got... I mean, it doesn't end well. <laughs> Let's say that. It doesn't end happy. Um, so it doesn't end happily. So do that. Um, it, you, so choose which one you want. Like if you want the one that's going to be a little more gentle on you, choose the short one. The long one is long, 17 pages. It, if you print it all out, double space. This is like the longest story that we've read. So there you go. All right. I will see you guys tomorrow. Cannot wait. Cannot wait to hear what you think about this next story. Probably the story with the most craft of any that we're reading in the whole two weeks. All right. See you guys tomorrow. I, I just can't stop. Like I just talked to you forever. See you tomorrow.